Hey, it's Nick and Brian from London Real. We've just had Graham Hancock on the show. He's the best-selling author of Fingerprints of the Gods, Supernatural, and his upcoming fictional book, War God. This guy is the real life Indiana Jones, and he's one of the most powerful people we've ever met. Check it out. This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. This is Nick Gabriel. And joining us in studio today is writer and journalist Graham Hancock, who's the author of Fingerprints of the Gods, Supernatural, and Entangled. Graham, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. It's a real pleasure having you here. Yeah, me too. I heard once that you had uh, said that all politicians should be required to drink ayahuasca ten times before taking office. Mm, yeah. Did you say that? I did say that, and, and uh, I actually do believe that to be the case. Uh, I think that uh, ayahuasca uh, requires us to confront the truth about ourselves. That's one of the fundamental universal experiences of anybody who has drunk the, the sacred visionary brew of the Amazon. And uh, confronting the truth about yourself in absolute honesty and clarity, uh, I think is a useful exercise for anyone, but I think it's a particularly useful exercise for anyone who wishes to present themselves as a leader uh, of others. Uh, I think the leadership role is um, uh, one that really does call for honesty, and that is what is absolutely lacking amongst our politicians uh, in, in the world today. I mean, all across the world, we have a venal class of dishonest, self-serving bureaucrats who are using the power we give them to impose themselves uh, upon us. And I think if they were obliged to confront the truth about themselves, they might do a better job. I'm trying to envision Mitt Romney taking ayahuasca or Obama taking ayahuasca. And it's not gonna happen. I always wonder if they might not even want to run for office after taking it might, like It that. might well change their view that they don't want to run for office at all. They might, they might feel that they don't want to do that anymore. It is, um, it is a, it is a life-changing uh, e experience and it calls for uh, inner resources of uh, courage and uh, determination and will uh, to go through with uh, an ayahuasca journey. Um, and it does make you think about the world you live in and your place in it and your impact upon, upon other human beings. And that's what's, um, contrary to what they tell us about themselves, that's what's really lacking, I think, in the political class around the world today. I find that when I tell people about our ayahuasca journey, which we've documented and we're very serious about, is that a lot of people just quickly kind of tune out when you start talking to them about well, that. Well, you, you see, you have to understand that we've, we've had more than 40 years now of um, massively financed propaganda uh, called the war on drugs. And uh, ironically, we ourselves, the taxpayers uh, around the world, have paid for that propaganda to be beamed at us uh, with our taxes. Um, and this has been a, a systematic effort to persuade us that uh, any consciousness-altering drug other than alcohol, caffeine, or tobacco, uh, which are all consciousness-altering drugs, of course, uh, any consciousness-altering drug which is not channeled to us through the large pharmaceutical companies, uh, because, of course, Ritalin is a consciousness-altering drug, mm, yeah. and uh, Siroxat is a consciousness-altering drug, and Prozac is a consciousness-altering drug. But all of those, you know, are supposed to be okay because they come to us through Big Pharma. But any consciousness-altering plant or substance, which may have been in use in human cultures for thousands and thousands of years, such as, such as ayahuasca, uh, has been subjected to 40-plus years of extremely negative, demonizing propaganda, which we take in with our mother's milk. And it is extremely difficult to overcome the knee-jerk reaction to that. It's become so internalized. In a way, it's a very Orwellian world that we, that we live in, where language is being, used, uh, is being used against us to control and manage the way that we think about things. So it's almost impossible to approach uh, the issue of quote-unquote drugs without immediately linking it to the notion of abuse 
or of frivolous, irresponsible behavior, or of danger, or of threat, or of damage. All of these concepts have been added together in the propaganda of the war on drugs, and it really messes up uh, people's thinking about what really is uh, an, an, an extremely serious and fundamental issue of human rights, which mm -hmm. is, do we, as adults, have the right to make decisions about what we put in our own bodies and what we experience with our own consciousness without reference to the powers of the state? Or must we seek permission from the state in order to explore our own consciousness? And that is the very unfortunate state of affairs that we find ourselves in today, where certain states of consciousness, doing no harm to others, in the privacy of one's own home or in a ceremonial shamanic circle, with reverence and, and respect to the universe and to nature, that such a thing is considered abhorrent and wrong, and we must not even be allowed to think about doing that. This is the way that our minds are controlled uh, in the society we live in today, and it's so subtle and so clever and so deeply ingrained that we actually think these thoughts are coming from us, that they've not really been programmed into us. Is that conspiratorial, or do you think it's, I mean, are there people that are pulling on the strings to make this happen? I think, there's, I think there's certainly people who's pulling on the strings. I mean, the question of where the conspiracy comes from is, is an interesting one. I'm not, you know, big on the Illuminati and all of that stuff. Mm. It doesn't actually ring any huge bells for me. me I think it's, I think it's, it's actually perhaps more, more mundane than that. Uh, that once you get a large bureaucracy set up with a particular objective and funded with public money, that that bureaucracy over a period of time becomes a self-serving, self-perpetuating entity. Any, any large bu bureaucracy uh, you know, will have its public relations arm. Uh, and the main function of that public relations arm is to convince the public who fund the bureaucracy in the first place through their taxes, is to convince the, convince the public that, the, that that bureaucracy is needed and is, and is necessary. So we have a huge investment in our society, um, you know, whether, whether through, the, uh, through, the, through the police or various drugs, drugs control agencies or indeed the social services, we have a huge investment in our society um, in a world in which the use of any kind of, of uh, drug is illegal and, and uh, is considered to be harmful and damaging and, and, and dangerous. And, and huge bureaucracies, tens of thousands of jobs are tied up in perpetuating this war, this war on drugs. And those tens of thousands of jobs are bolstered and supported by public relations operations, again funded by ourselves to persuade us that it's right and just and true and proper that it should be so. In such a climate where you know no investment is being put into the alternative point of view, to considering is there in fact perhaps a responsible and useful function for the things that we call drugs, which in the Amazon they don't call ayahuasca a drug. Mm. Ayahuasca is a, is a medicine. Uh, it's an instrument and an agent of, of, of healing and of, and of self-knowledge. But our society won't allow those terms to be applied uh, to, such, to such substances. So we have, we have a situation where our, the very tools with, with which we think have been taken out of our hands, and the language itself has been so corrupted and so abused that it's very difficult to think clearly on these subjects. Mm -hmm. And I find again and again that you get these instant knee-jerk reactions. Oh, they're talking about a drug. This mm -hmm. isn't for me. They must be in some way bad or damaged or dirty people whose, 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 whose thoughts may be damaging in some way to me. And the person switches off, switches off their mind in, in, instantly. And then right there, right then, the government, the state, the big bureaucracies have won the battle. Mm. They've won it. With, before any fighting was ever done, before any argument was ever engaged in, before any discussion was ever involved, they've won right there at the beginning. Mm. People just switch off their minds. That is the victory of bureaucracy. Maybe that's ultimately one of the barriers that um, people seeking the truth have to face is that huge um, opposing pressure from the government and that this brainwashing that we all face about ayahuasca, maybe that's one of the first tests you have to pass to be able to see through that. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. do know what you mean. It is, it is, it is indeed one of the, fir the first tests that you have to pass. You have to, you have to be a person who is prepared to some extent to go against the conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. You have to be a person who is prepared to think 
for, for himself or herself. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're not prepared to do that, then you're not going to be drawn mm -hmm. towards, towards ayahuasca. It's like a, it's, uh, it's part of the self-initiation process with, with ayahuasca that, that ma many, many people are, are never drawn to it at all because mm -hmm. it involves taking that step over a, an invisible line, mm -hmm. which we have been taught since childhood that we must not transgress. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to, to do that. Uh, just as the very as the very first step. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, once you um, investigate ay ayahuasca, uh, perhaps by talking to others who've worked with ayahuasca and mm -hmm. finding out how reasonable and, and deeply thoughtful they often are as people, mm -hmm. uh, and and once you work with the brew itself, um, it will begin further to help you to decondition yourself from these mental controls that mm -hmm. operate on us in society, and that fundamentally is why it is regarded as so dangerous by the bureaucracy, because it is a deconditioning agent. Mm. It's very difficult to undergo a series of ayahuasca experiences and feel just the same as you felt before about the nature mm. of society, the nature of the world, the nature of reality itself. Mm. Interesting. For the people that, that don't know out there, how did you come to uh, your first time taking ayahuasca? I know it was a, quite a path. It was a path, yeah. I, I mean, first, first, of all, first off, um, I actually wasn't uh, much of a user of um, uh, so-called, you know, illicit illicit substances in my in my youth. Mm. Uh, I smoked a bit of ganja, a bit of you know cannabis in in my late teens, early early twenties, um, but just drifted out of my life. And and I had one LSD trip, totally by accident, in 1974 at the Windsor Free Festival. Somebody just gave me some and, and I was with three friends and I just took it. I didn't even really think about what I was doing. I, had a, I, I have to say I had the most amazing night. Okay. Um, it That's was cool. incredible. I spent 12 hours just walking around this amazing, amazing festival. It was like a, uh, somehow I felt I'd journeyed back in time. It was a very powerful, extremely positive experience. And, but, but when I came out of that experience the next morning, I'm 24 years old at this point, um, the, the thought I had was, this experience was so powerful, supposing it had gone the other way, mm. supposing that had been a very negative night for me, as it happened to be for one of my three friends that I, that I took LSD with that night. And I thought, actually, I'm not going to do this again. Mm. And I didn't. Uh, I, I went on for many, many years without... Um, without any contact with, uh, with, with psychedelics uh, at all. I did in my 30s, around the age of 37, um, re-encounter cannabis. And uh, I found it a helpful uh, agent and a helpful ally to me at that point in my life. That story has also moved on. But at that point in my life, um, cannabis was, was helpful to me. I think it helped to free me up from, a, from an over-materialistic, over-rational, over-intellectualized view of the world and loosened off some connections. And I, be I believe actually played quite a fundamental role um, in turning me from a current affairs journalist into somebody who was studying ancient mysteries and interested in writing an alternative take uh, on the view of the past. I don't think it's an accident that I, that I started smoking cannabis at round about the time that I re started researching The Sign and the Seal, which was the first book I wrote on a historical mystery. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe I actually would have written that book if I hadn't um, had this nudge from this, uh, this curious uh, plant ally yes. uh, called, uh, ca called, called cannabis. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to round that story off because uh, a, a year ago, uh, in October uh, 2011, um, after 24 years of continuous smoking of cannabis, I mean, I don't do things by half measures, <laughs> you know. I was, I was smoking a very great deal of cannabis for 24 years. Um, in the latter years, I used a vaporizer. This is something that I would urge anybody who smokes cannabis to consider, by the way, because um, the, the um, combustion products of smoking the stuff, of lighting it and burning it, are actually quite ha harmful to the lungs. Whereas a vaporizer, where effectively you're 
inhaling steam um, is much less harmful to the lungs. Yeah, I just and, found that the vaporizers got me too high. Well, they do, yeah. they do. But when you've been smoking nonstop for 24 years, it takes quite a lot mm. to get you very, very high. Mm. And, and uh, I found for, for my last five years as a, as a, a cannabis user, because mm. I, I've stopped using cannabis now, my last five years as a cannabis user, I was using a, a vaporizer. And I found, it, I found it very helpful. And I'd fire up the vaporizer at nine in the morning and I'd still be puffing away at two o'clock the next morning, seven wow. days a week, you know, 52 weeks a year. Um, I've got off the ayahuasca a little bit, but I'm gonna come back to it because it really connects to this. Mm. Um, in October last year, October 2011, I made a journey to Brazil and, um, and I had five ayahuasca sessions in Brazil. And during those uh, ayahuasca sessions, the intelligence, whatever it is, the mysterious, entity that lies behind ayahuasca spoke to me very, very directly and made it absolutely clear to me that my journey with cannabis needed to come to an end. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that, I had, that I had stepped over the line from uh, sacred use of a helpful plant ally into daily abuse of that plant and that it was making me a, a toxic and unhelpful person wow. to others who were close to me. Um, and I, I, I had, it had become cl clear to me in my last three or four years of cannabis use that this, that this was the case. For example, I mean, everybody knows this, but it, it, it is one of the well-known side effects of cannabis. I did become very paranoid. Mm -hmm. When you become paranoid, it makes, you, it makes you very unhelpful to people around you because instead of trusting, and trust is the most fundamental, valuable, social, you know, skill. It's something we, re we really do need to trust others. It makes you untrusting, and that's, not, and that's not good. So, although I'd been drinking ayahuasca since 2003, it, was two th it never addressed my cannabis habit. But in 2011, at exactly the point where, where cannabis really had ceased to serve me, and I had started to serve it, mm. ayahuasca stepped in a big way, and I was just kicked about for the whole five sessions you know, shown all kind of really in very deep symbolic language why I wow. needed to stop doing this and I needed to stop doing it straight away. Wow. And, and I actually couldn't believe, I expressed the intent, we have a sharing after every ayahuasca session, as I'm sure you know, sure, yeah. and where we share our experiences. And I expressed the intent in those shared experiences to alter my relationship with cannabis. I did not believe after 24 years, uh, it was intimately tied up with my writing. I felt that how could I possibly write without cannabis? I expressed the intent to alter my relationship with cannabis, to use it less, but I didn't believe I would remove it entirely from my life. When I came back to England, after those five sessions in, in Brazil, which were the most profound, the most earth-shaking, the most overturning of all my journeys with ayahuasca, when I came back from those, those five sessions, the very first thing I did after getting off the plane, exhausted, was go down to my office Trash and fire up the vaporizer. <laughs> and, and no, I fired up the vaporizer and I filled the bag and I took a puff and I started to feel awful. And I took a second puff and I was filled with such feelings of horror and self-loathing, such feelings of jeopardy, the sense that I was poised on the edge of an abyss over which if I just continued doing this one more day, I would step forever. Yeah. That I expressed the vapor out of that bag, I switched off the vaporizer, and since that night, I haven't touched cannabis again. I got rid of everything that I had, I no longer use it, I had no cravings to use it. Far from uh, diminishing my writing, my writing has um, definitely uh, improved. I'm not patting myself on the back, others recognize this as well. Yeah. Um, and, and my output has, has improved. I used to struggle sometimes to do 300 words a day. I can write 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 words a day now. I'm much, I'm much clearer. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, the, the paranoia, the negative feelings that had been that had been making me a, a toxic individual to be around, they've all cleared away, just 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 gone. So I'm. Uh, it's it's astonishing that one plant <laughs> intervened <laughs> to stop me working with a, with another plant. Mm -hmm. um, I think I needed to make that stop. I think I had gone 
with cannabis to the point where it was no longer helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not saying that I'll never smoke it again. Perhaps a day will come when it'll be okay. I'll know when that day is. But right now, it's not something that serves me. And, and when I say that, I don't wish to put down others who smoke cannabis because cannabis is an incredible medicinal plant. Um, it's a sensual plant. It's a, it's, it's a plant that opens many creative links in the, in, in the mind. But it is a plant that can be abused. And, and it is a plant that can be overused. Mm. And I definitely was overusing it. I, don't, I actually think we should approach, approach all of these ancient sacred plants as sacred objects. I don't think we should, um, we should regard them as something that we must depend on 24 hours a day. There should be ritual, there should be ceremony, there should be reverence, there should be respect. And I, had, I was not doing that. Mm. And, and, and ayahuasca just intervened and made it, it took the matter actually out of my hands. You know, I went back, as I told you, I fired up the vapors. I couldn't smoke it. Man. I was physically stopped. And, and for this, I have to thank ayahuasca. So for anybody who says, oh, ayahuasca is just another drug, remember that ayahuasca actually is a teacher and that ayahuasca has been used in many different countries uh, to get people off harmful, severe drug addictions, for exa example, heroin and cocaine addictions. Mm. Uh, and it does so through presenting you with a revelation about yourself, just as I was presented with a revelation about my overuse and, and abuse of, uh, of, of cannabis. Um, and and uh, so I, I wanted to make that point, f first of all, as to your question, how did I get into ayahuasca? <laughs> Rambling discourse, but uh, I was mentioning that I, I didn't have a lot of contact with psychedelics in my, in my youth, my, my early years. What happened is, as a researcher, I believe uh, that I should not sit in an armchair and pontificate and just read books. I have to get into the subject I'm investigating. And it happened uh, in, from about 2002 onwards that what I was investigating was shamanism and the role of shamanism in the origins of human culture. Uh, and that investigation led me to the fact that many shamans uh, around the world use visionary plants as a means to get into the shamanistic trance. I was actually looking at cave art and the cave paintings and the, the new research which indicates strongly that that was the work of shamans who had experienced altered states of consciousness and were manifesting what they saw in visions on the cave walls. And I suddenly realized, I don't just have to read about this. I can actually do this because there are still shamans in the world today. And that's when I found out about ayahuasca, that there were shamans in the Amazon who were working with this powerful visionary agent, which is a mixture of two plants together with water, uh, and who indeed often afterwards were painting their visions, just as the ancient cave, cave artists painted their visions on the walls of caves. So I could have that experience. And that led me in 2003 to go down to the Amazon and have my first 11 journeys uh, with ayahuasca in the context of the Amazon jungle uh, itself. And at that point, it was a research project for me. Uh, but I found the lessons that I was taught by ayahuasca uh, and the experiences that I un under underwent and, and, and really a complete shift in my understanding of the nature of reality so valuable and so useful to me uh, that despite the many difficulties involved in drinking ayahuasca, despite the fact that it is hard work physically, it does make you feel ill, um, and it does put you through the ringer psychologically. You really have to confront you know, your own inner demons. Um, despite that, I felt that it was, it was something that was teaching me valuable lessons. And so I made the decision to brace myself about once a year, and usually to go down to Brazil uh, if I can manage to do so, and have uh, five ayahuasca sessions over a period of two weeks in Brazil, once a year or once every 18 months or so, um, and, and learn what I can from those, from yeah, those sessions. I was going to ask you about the t the, how often you did it. I mean, this time when you went last year of October, do you, do you start to dread it a few weeks out or a few months out, or is it something you kind of know you need to do? Yeah, I'm, I'll tell you now because I'm going to be doing it in Brazil again in January, and, uh, okay. and I am actually dreading it now. Mm, I've got a, a trip booked um, for Peru in, in December. Yes. And I'm just hearing you, I'm terrified. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's scary. You know, there are, there are all kinds of ways in this world for us to challenge ourselves. Some people might do it by climbing a mountain. You know, some people might do it by scuba diving. Well, I've done that, actually, deep scuba diving. Some people might, might, might d do it by jumping out of an airplane and hoping the parachute will open. You know, where there's lots of ways to challenge ourselves. But actually... One of the most profound and challenging ordeals 
is to drink ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is, it is, in a way, um, the ultimate uh, adventure. Uh, but it's an but it's an advent like any like any adventure in, in in strange and difficult and sometimes dangerous territory. You really have to brace yourself for it. And, have you ever felt sometimes on an ayahuasca trip that you weren't going to make it back? Yes, I have. I have felt that I'm not going to make it back, mm -hmm. and that's why um, for anybody who's thinking of working with ayahuasca, I would urge you don't buy the ingredients on the internet and sit at home and drink it. Mm -hmm. Work with an experienced knowledgeable, goodwill chaman, and a network will tell you who is good and who is not, because there are, um, like any other area of human endeavor, there are people working in the ayahuasca field who are negative and who are not, who are not good. I, you, you know, this is, this is uh, I'm afraid, human nature. Mm. Um, I, ayahuasca, I, I believe the, the, the substance, the brew, the brew, it, brew itself, is, uh, is a vehicle for, for, for contact with the realm of spirit. And, uh, and, 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 and with profound and beautiful truths. Mm. Uh, but the realm of spirit is not without jeopardy. Mm. And when you open the door and enter that realm, uh, people who have not had this experience may, may well think that I'm nuts in saying mm. this, but there are intelligences out there. And not all of those intelligences are filled with light. Mm. Some of those intelligences are very, very, very dark, mm. and they seek to exploit uh, human weakness, and unfortunately, they connect with negative human beings uh, who sometimes present themselves as shamans. So there, there are bad shamans as well as good shamans. Mm -hmm. It's important to know this, mm -hmm. and it's uh, uh, so it's important to do your groundwork very, very carefully before you go. And I would say never to drink ayahuasca alone. It's not something. It's something to be done in a social context, in a ceremonial context, uh, with a with a knowledgeable and experienced guide. Do you have any rituals um, prior to an upcoming um, ceremony that you participate in, like, say, meditating? Or, I mean, obviously you follow the diet for a few weeks before. Or is there anything you do to prepare yourself? Um, <clears throat> I, do, I do a number of things. First, first of all, I cut alcohol out of my life. Mm -hmm. um, alcohol and ayahuasca are not good companions, mm -hmm. and it's a, good idea not, it's a good idea to be clean of alcohol for, for at least a month uh, okay. prior to that. Um, I just try to go into a still place in my mind and say, okay, I have an ordeal coming up and I have to prepare myself mentally for that to be as resolute as I can. And, and what am I looking for when I go into, what is my, my intent? You know, I'm do, you, not, do you feel that's important to have a um, well thought out set of questions or um, set yes. of objectives before you actually... Yeah, I do. I think, it's, I think, it's, I think it's, really, it's really important to do that. Mm -hmm. As anybody who's you know, worked with ay ayahuasca a lot will, will know, you know what you intend for the session may not be what you get. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, you know, what you get ultimately in the broad scheme of things was what you needed. You know, You'll find that out. Graham, I'm really interested to know why... Um, why you keep going back? I mean, surely uh, you're, uh, you've learned all that you need to learn in that realm, or? Well, no, apparently not. Um, you know, because <clears throat> last year's last year's sessions were brought brought about a radical life change for me mm -hmm. after after many years of drinking ayahuasca. You know, we have huge resistance. It's it's very strong. It's very built in. We fight against mm -hmm. this, and 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 I feel like any school which is teaching valuable lessons it's worth spending time learning the, and trying to not only learning the lessons but trying to implement them into the action of one's own one's own life that's mm. the hardest thing actually it's to come back and integrate the lessons mm. you've learned into daily practice and not to slip back into old and bad habits mm -hmm. um, so no i don't feel i'm i don't feel i'm done with ayahuasca yet or that ayahuasca is done with me. Mm -hmm. But I do have to say that the, that the experiences I had last year, which led, led me to give up uh, cannabis, were so earth-shaking um, and, and uh, utterly terrifying in certain, certain ways. I, I mean, the, 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 the shaman who I work with had to, had to spend a lot of time with me um, during one of those nights because I was, I was in a deeply fragile uh, and, and emotionally disturbed state. Were you under attack from a negative entity? Or? I felt that I was under attack from a negative entity. I felt that, uh, that I was being, um, 
I was being shown the negative entity that I had invited in uh, through my own uh, n negative use of cannabis over a very long period of time. Interesting. That is I very felt, interesting. I thought I was being shown that, and, and this is actually what it is. This is the thing that's dancing all over you and really in the process of drawing you down into the abyss. Mm -hmm. Confront it, deal with it. And I mean, boy, I, I really had a, I had a very uh, grueling, not just one night, but, but, but series of nights. Wow. So I'm, I'm absolutely apprehensive about going back and doing this again. Um, I'm, I hope that I have integrated the lessons, that I have learned the lessons. I would be very grateful if Mother Ayahuasca gives me a gentler journey mm -hmm. the next time as I, I've had gentler journeys in the past, I, I would not like to be put through the mill again. Um, <laughs> no, no one wants that, but it's usually the best thing for us. It, right? it is the best thing. And, 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 you know, and I'm able to serve as a living example of that because I have, I have actually made a change in my life, which is measurable, which mm. is really there. It's, real, it's a real thing. I've changed a fundamental area of my life, which I never believed that I would, that I would change. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. Wow. What, what, what in, how do you describe to other people what happens, say, when, when you drink ayahuasca? And we've got a bunch of other things to talk about as well, mm. but how do you describe it to people? Is there a spirit involved? Is there some other entity involved? Is there... Well, um, I think, first of all, I don't want to uh, presuppose anybody else's experience. I can only say what I feel is the case. Um, and, and, and I'm not claiming that what I feel is the absolute truth. This is just my experience of the extraordinary and mysterious ayahuasca journey. It's my reading of it. It's my interpretation of it. Um, I think that uh, I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I, I feel that what, um, I, what ayahuasca does uh, is to allow us to make accessible to our senses areas of reality that are normally off limits to us. I believe that those are real, not fictions of the brain. Mm. What the shamans call the spirit world, what quantum physicists might call parallel universes or parallel dimensions. I think they exist. And I think that we as a species uh, and, and as a social animal conditioned in, particularly in, the, in Western technological society, um, have been brought up from childhood to shut ourselves off from those other areas of reality, the areas that are ac accessed in dreaming and visionary states. We've been taught to despise them, to regard them as aberrations, and to regard them as fictional, mm -hmm. just made up by the brain. I don't think they're made up by the brain. I, and, and I always, the, the model I use is that the, that the brain is a receiver or a transceiver of consciousness rather than a generator of consciousness. And that as such, as a transceiver, uh, the receiver wavelength of consciousness may be adjusted. And I think that that's what happens with ayahuasca. And I think that we gain access to other levels of reality uh, and the intelligences that inhabit those other levels of reality, which for some reason are interested in the human race. And some of them in a very dark and negative way and some of them in a very positive and nurturing and helpful way. And, mm. and many have had the experience of mother ayahuasca, of a female spirit, of an entity who lies behind the ayahuasca vine. For me, she's an angel who is, who is gaining access to us uh, through the ancient shamanistic technology of the leaf and the vine and water brought together. She, that's how she gains it. She's never gained access to us in the normal, alert, problem-solving mode of consciousness with which we confront daily life. We have to be in an altered state of consciousness to access those entities. And amongst them is the entity that many have come to call Mother Ayahuasca, um, who is concerned with the jungle, who is concerned with the environment, who is, in a way, I called her an angel, but the mother goddess of, mm. our, of our planet. Um, and, and who realizes that the, uh, the human race need help right now. We, we need help. Mm -hmm. Just as we are in the process of raping and destroying and burning down the Amazon jungle, it's interesting that a spirit has come out of the Amazon jungle through the medium of the ayahuasca vine and started to speak to people all over the world and saying, whoa, you know, hang on, guys. What you're doing is not smart. You need to think again about what you're doing. Mm. This is, this is a, w another one of the universal experiences of, of working with ayahuasca. So what do, how would I describe the ayahuasca experience? First of all, brace yourself. It tastes horrible. <laughs> smells horrible. 
It most often will give you nausea, most often will give you vomiting, sometimes diarrhea, make you sweaty, make you dizzy. Physically, it's no fun. Mm. And uh, secondly, prepare yourself to be confronted with a life review. Look at the place that you've played in the world amongst those who are close to you, amongst those who love you and those who, who, who you love, and just consider how you've acted and related to them. And, and you will be presented with the truth about that. It's not an accident that, that many people find themselves in floods of tears in ayahuasca sessions because they suddenly realize that they're not such a nice guy Me. as they thought they were. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's that, that sense of wasted opportunity that I wasted my time being so hurtful and toxic towards others when I could have been just so much better that leads to those, those floods of tears very, very often. Um, but that's, a, that's painful, but that's an opportunity that's saying, look, we can't change the past, but we certainly can fix the way we behave in the future. It's giving us that, that revelation. Some people have said it's like you know, 20 years of psychotherapy in one, in one night. Yeah. Well, yes. Are you quoting me from my article? <laughs> no, okay. I, well, maybe. I mean, a, that's a well-known saying with ayahuasca okay. because, as a, as a matter of fact, quite a number of psychotherapists have taken ayahuasca okay. and, they, and they know, yeah. you know that this uh, ayahuasca will, will bring you to revelations that psych, psych, psychotherapy might take decades to bring you to. Mm. Um, it's, it's really uh, extraordinarily difficult, but you are being offered the opportunity to make changes in your life. And that is an incredibly valuable opportunity because most often it's difficult to make changes because you don't, simply don't see they're needed. Ayahuasca, sooner or later, she will show you what you need to do. Whether oh. you do it, that's up to you, but she will, that she will show right. you. And then beyond that, there's the enchanted realm of vision. There's the, 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 the sense of, of a magical universe that we are actually not caught up in something mundane and physical and down to earth only, but in something that's deeply enchanted and, and, and magical in this adventure of life and in the incredible opportunity to be born in a human body and to undergo the teaching and learning experiences that life in a human body involves and to live on this beautiful garden of a planet surrounded by you know, the majestic wonder of the universe to look up at night and see that and be part of that and wonder where, where we are in the, in, in the scheme of things, that there is behind all this not just dead physical processes, but a profound magical intelligence which is at work in the universe. Ayahuasca will show you that sooner or later more clearly than anything else. Oh you could ever experience. It's a wonderful description. Now, you, you're very outspoken about it. Obviously, we've talked about it on the show. We've written articles about it. Is, is there more we should be doing? Or do you think there's only so much? Is the communicating is what we can do? We're in a very, we're in a very interesting time here. I sometimes think, uh, in my studies of, of, of history, there was a, there was a time um, in early Christianity when there was a thing called Gnosticism, mm -hmm. uh, which was... Um, which was a very different take on Christianity. It didn't even see Christ as a physical being. It saw, saw him as a, as a spiritual entity, a, teach, a teacher, who, who, whose purpose was to bring gnosis, understanding, revelation of the meaning of life to us. Um, and that Gnosticism, uh, which was knitted in with early Christianity, was jumped upon by the Roman Catholic Church and the power of the state of Rome and utterly devastated and destroyed. And people were right back then, 300, 400s AD, were being burned at the stake, something that the Christian religion has continued, did continue to do for many centuries after that. And for a long time, people who practiced Gnosticism had to do so underground. And they had to, and, and by the way, there's strong evidence that Gnostics used visionary plants, particularly psychedelic mushrooms, in order to, to gain access to the divine. Um, that there were underground groups which passed knowledge by word of mouth, which met secretly, which, which this is rather like it is with ayahuasca today. Mm. Um, it's a whole alternative way of approaching the meaning and the mystery of life. And it, ha it can't be done on the surface. It has to be done, particularly in the West, it has to be done under the radar. Um, and this is, this is, is difficult. Uh, because, you know, and, that, and this is caused by this moronic thing called the war on drugs, mm -hmm. this, this 
evil and wicked misuse of public money. Um, we ought to be able, in a responsible society, as responsible adults, to gain good information. If we want to experiment with our consciousness, we should be able to gain good and reliable information easily. Instead, it's very difficult. We have to go underground. We have yeah. to... to, to stay out of the mainstream in any way in order to learn about ayahuasca. So we, we live in a time where if people want to work with ayahuasca in the West, they have to break a law. Um, and uh, they, therefore that requires a certain amount of discretion. Um, and and uh, it's difficult to get, to get all the information that you need. Mm. You know, you know um, Graham, I wanted to ask you a, <laughs> quite a, an open-ended um, question. Uh, you are obviously someone who's had a very um, keen observation of, of the world for pretty much your whole life, it seems. Mm -hmm. You've looked into all these different systems. You, you've got a degree in sociology. You've done archaeology. You've traveled the world exploring. Um, and I personally have heard many different theories on, on why or how we came to be here, our human, the human species. And I'd, I'd really like to know what, what your theory is why why do you think we're here where did we come from i know it's it's quite a, a powerful question but yeah the layman's answer that's, I guess. that's a big that's a big one um i've been i've been very lucky i feel i've i've been blessed i've lived a blessed life i'm, mm -hmm. I'm grateful to the universe for giving me the chance to to to, to live this this life mm -hmm. um i can't give you any facts i can only give you my view, mm -hmm. which is what exactly um, which what is, I'm interested in, which is that that this world is a is a theatre of experience. That that consci that uh, consciousness is fundamentally a non physical thing. It's one of the fundamental forces of the universe, mm -hmm. um, like gravity, like like electricity. Consciousness is a is a fundamental force of the universe, mm -hmm. and I think that consciousness has chosen to manifest in physical form, uh, and perhaps has uh, invested in a very long process of manifestation in the earth, a four and a half billion year process mm. um, using evolution. I am not against evolution. Mm. Evolution is obvious. It's mm -hmm. obvious. It's a fact. It's there. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean there's no spirit. It, it's wrongly mm -hmm. used. If people, people, say, people like Richard Dawkins say, I, I've demonstrated that evolution exists, therefore there's no meaning to life. I don't get the logical link that leads him to say mm -hmm. that. Um, I, would, I would say that the spirit world, for want of a better fr phrase, has used evolution uh, to manifest physical entities in which, in which consciousness can uh, emerge and express itself and learn lessons. This world is a theater of experience. Mm -hmm. We are here to learn and to grow and to develop. We're here to learn lessons, lessons that can only be taught in a physical realm. Mm -hmm. And there's an, so it's an incredible opportunity to be born in a human body. Mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole biosphere is here to support us. Four billion more or, or more years of evolution have led us to this point where we can make these very fine distinctions between, between good and evil, between darkness and light, where we can make choices that will impact upon us and upon others in, in profound ways. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is an extraordinary opportunity. So I would say, don't waste it. You know, you were given this chance to be born as a human being. This is why society is so demonic today, because it exists to switch people off, to bombard us with, uh, to bombard our consciousness with um, meaningless messages of production and consumption mm -hmm. uh, that never get to the fundamentals of, of anything that persuade, and, and, and to seek to persuade us that we're just meat, you know, just, just accidents mm -hmm. of physics and chemistry. Uh, and that our only purpose is to, is to produce and consume as much as possible. And when we die, we're dead, and that's the end. I don't believe that for a moment. Mm. I think we're part of a very, very long journey. I think we may come and, and, and ma manifest in, in human form on this earth many times. Mm. I, I, to me, reincarnation makes perfect sense. Mm. I, absolutely, I absolutely think it makes sense. And there are consequences. Uh, if you live a wicked an evil life, if you don't learn the lessons you've been given the opportunity to learn, mm -hmm. if you detract from others' sovereignty, if you add to the misery in the world, that will have consequences for you beyond this realm. Mm -hmm. Don't ever imagine that it won't. Mm -hmm. 
you know, really we need to be very careful about what we do with this opportunity we were given. And, and, uh, but the first thing is to realize that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for spiritual growth. The ancient Egyptians typed it, type, typecast it as, as um, the perfection of the soul. That, they, that that's what we're here to do. We're here to take this, this rough diamond and, and turn it into a, a polished and glowing jewel. Mm. That's the opportunity we've been, we've been given in the 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 years. Whatever chance we get, it's a random element in, in life, whatever, whatever years we get, use them well mm. to, 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 to grow uh, as, a, as a spirit and, and to help others to, to grow. There has to be a spirit of love behind this. Mm. You know, if everything is selfishness and greed and me, 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 and I'm looking after my interests and, you know, I'm going to do down everybody else's interests, well, that may serve you for a few years. But in the grand scheme of things, in the, in the immortal, in the eternal scheme, scheme of things, it doesn't serve you at all. Mm. It diminishes you and, and, and limits you and, and, and closes you down. Why waste that opportunity to grow? That's what, that's what I think we're here to do. I think we're here to grow as spirits and the demonic nature of modern society is that it has severed our connection with spirit mm -hmm. and even persuaded us that there is no such thing as spirit. Yeah. You know, Brian, I think you should follow that on the best answer ever. Yeah, <laughs> I was just like, wow. Wow, that was amazing. Yeah. I want to uh, find out about your new book. Can mm. you talk about it? Or can, I know you've <laughs> well, been working on it. So I've, I, I'm known for, for these you know, big non-fiction investigations of historical mysteries. Uh, of which the law, I mean, there was Fingerprints of the Gods is my best-known book. Yeah. And one day I may revisit the, the lost civilization quest that, that was behind Fingerprints of the Gods uh, in another non-fiction book. But another thing that ayahuasca has done to me, um, and also myself, you know, I'm, I'm 62 years old now. I, I, I know that my stay on this planet is, um, is limited, as it is for all of us. We are all here temporarily. Nobody lives forever. I believe it goes on. I believe something comes. But I want to make the best and the most of the years that I have here. And my, my particular gift, whatever, w at whatever level it, it's at, is writing. And I um, came to feel very strongly that I was done with nonfiction for a while, with the big historical investigation. And particularly so since my nonfiction writing had become more and more defensive because my work was so much attacked by academics mm -hmm. that I needed to erect barriers of protection around every argument that I put and thousands of footnotes and detailed arguments just to make sure that the academics couldn't twist and distort it in, in, in any way. I don't like writing defensively. And I came to the realization that actually where I want to exercise myself as a writer uh, is in fiction. And uh, again, ayahuasca played a huge role in this uh, because my first novel, which was called uh, Entangled, yeah. and which is in fact the first volume of a series of two, uh, was inspired by a series of ayahuasca visions. I was given the essential dilemma, the basic characters, the story that I was to tell. Um, which is a story of the battle of good against evil, which has one character in the Stone Age 24,000 years ago and one character today in the 21st century, both young women um, who are brought together outside time um, by a being that I call the Blue Angel, who's really Mother Ayahuasca, mm -hmm. uh, to do battle with a demon who, who travels through time and who, and who works on the negative side of human consciousness. Um, now, <laughs> I may want to exercise myself as a writer, but it seems that my readers don't particularly want to read my novels because, you know, contrary to my, 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 my nonfiction, which has always, which has always done pretty, pretty well, uh, my, my first novel has been, has been completely ignored, uh, which, is, which is fine. I, I completely uh, ac accept that. I have chosen, perhaps perversely, to reinvent myself in my 60s and to become a different kind of writer. Why should I expect my readers to come with me on that journey? Why should I expect them even to open my book or even consider what might be in it? But no one's ever done what you've done. I mean, purely non-fictional work and then flipped into a fiction. No, piece, it's right? kind of a strange thing to do. I mean, everybody in publishing <laughs> would great. tell you this is a really bad career move, you know. Um, but I, I, I feel that it's, it's the move that I need to make. And also that in the, in the realm of fiction, 
um, I can explore extraordinary ideas without having to, you know, bolster them up with huge amounts of argumentation and facts and figures and documents and numbers. And okay. uh, I, I feel it's a it's an it's an area of freedom as a writer for me. Uh, so I will come back and write the second volume of uh, of Entangled. I've, I've, the first volume was published in 2010, and and I've written about 100 pages of the second volume, but I haven't completed it yet because um, I've got drawn into another novel of which I've written two out of three volumes and that will the first the first of those will be published in in England in April uh, 2013 okay. and it will be called War God and it is a novel about the Spanish conquest of Mexico wow. and well, about cool. and about yeah. the spiritual forces at work behind history because the thing that intrigues me about you know when I was researching fingerprints of the gods I traveled very extensively in Mexico and it's impossible to travel in Mexico and look at the ruins of ancient Mexico and look at the cultures of ancient Mexico without realizing that the people who we call the Aztecs, who called themselves the Mexica, uh, had been drawn very far into the dark side. These were... Human sacrifice and whatnot. T terrible. I, I mean, there, there, there is a very clear documentation uh, on one occasion of the sacrifice of 80,000, 80,000 human beings over a period of four days to inaugurate the Great Pyramid at Tenochtitlan, so that the entire city was just filled with human blood. This is, the, the, the society they created is like um, if, you, if, if you gave the worst serial killers in history a license to create the kind of society they wanted, mm -hmm. it would have been Aztec, Mexica no, society. No Absolutely horror, true, horror. true horror. And when you look at the documents, you find that Moctezuma, the last of the Aztec uh, emperors, um, was actually in daily contact with a demonic entity, with, a, with an entity that they called Huitzilopochtli, the war god, uh, who was luring him into ever more violent and awful and hideous human behavior. Mm. And right at that time, appears on the coast of Mexico, 500 Spaniards, uh, in a little armada of ships led by a man called Hernan Cortez, mm -hmm. who's also in contact with a spirit entity, who he happens to construe as Saint Peter. And that spirit entity is telling him to do awful and hideous things. Mm -hmm. It's like the demonic realm got involved in the human world and said, we've made things really bad in Mexico already. How can we make them even worse? Bring in the Spaniards. Oh. You know, and in a karmic sense, I mean, the Aztecs uh, deserved Cortez. It was divine retribution almost. But in just sheer numbers and horror, things got even worse mm -hmm. after the Spanish came. The population of the Valley of Mexico went from 30 million to 1 million in the 50 years after the conquest. 29 million people died. I mean, this is genocide. On an extraordinary scale. as well? Yeah, it did, it did, the smallpox was deliberately introduced to Tenochtitlan okay. by the Spanish okay. uh, as a first, one of the first deliberate uses of biological warfare. Right. So I thought, actually, this is a, this is a fascinating arena uh, in which to set uh, an, a novel. Uh, and to, you can't deny the, 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 the courage and the spirit of adventure of the people involved. Um, and... and um, that is part of the part of the story. There's also fascinating uh, f female characters. There was a woman called Malinal, um, who for some reason had a had a grudge against Montezuma, and and history allows doesn't speak why that reason is. But I've been able to explore those possibilities mm -hmm. in the novel. Um, who becomes the interpreter uh, for Cortez? Mm -hmm. um, he acquires her as a, uh, it, given to him as a slave, and she rapidly learns Spanish and becomes his interpreter. Uh, and sh it's clear that she uses him as a weapon to destroy Montezuma, that, she's, that she is using Cortez to get her revenge. So, that, so there's a fascinating human story to tell here and the relationship between Cortez and, and Malinal. And they did eventually have a child. Then he dumped her um, and left her in the most awful situation. But, but there, there's a tremendous human drama. And in a way, it's the, it's the last immense struggle of the ancient world. It's more like the time of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar than it is like the modern world. And yet it's only 500 years ago. And we are coming up close to the 500th anniversary of the Spanish conquest mm -hmm. of Mexico. So I've written 
two out of three volumes of that. The first will be published in April next year, the next one about six months mm. after that, and the next one about six months after that. And perhaps my, perhaps my readers will pay some attention to those. I, I don't know, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to tell the best story I can, but I am, I am fu fundamentally, I'm writing for me, not, yeah. n and, and I hope other people I'll enjoy be, I'll it. I'll be first in line to buy that book, Graham. That sounds amazing. That sounds fascinating. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Was it difficult to decide on this as a topic, or was it really calling you? No, it had been calling me for a long time. Uh, ever since I did my travels in Mexico and got the sense of that, that dark, heavy weight of, of horror that lies over Mexico and uh, inherited from, from history, and found myself accidentally uh, pursuing the route of Cortez and seeing the, the lands through which he, he, he traveled and the, you know, the really quite, quite extraordinary things that he, that he did. And, you know, one can't put that down because he turned up with 500 men and he confronted a standing army of 200,000 uh, and he won. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, it, it was a really extraordinary thing to do, but he would not have won if the Aztecs hadn't been evil. The reason the Aztecs ultimately were defeated was that all their neighbors hated them. The Tlaxcalans, for example, who became Cortes' most important allies, were used as a human farm by the Aztecs. They just raided them to take people for human sacrifice. And when they, they figured out, here is this guy, this Cortes, we can use him to get rid of the Aztecs. If the Aztecs had been decent to their neighbors, Mm. If they'd operated with a spirit of love to their neighbors, then Cortes could have been stopped at the border and never brought in, and the whole history of the world would have been different, because the conquest of Mexico set the pattern for everything else that happened in the Americas. Soon afterwards, the conquest of Peru, and later on, the genocide in North America. That whole pattern was set by what Cortes did in Mexico. Mm. So actually, it's a pivotal moment in, in human history. Have you seen the film uh, Apocalypto? I have seen the film Apocalypto. Mm. That, that challenged that my worldview. I mean, I just was thinking of people actually went through experiences like that, they had did. their fam, like they were in their village farming, and this uh, tribe would just come in and take their yeah. Their and this happened. This place. happened. I mean, my novel begins in the fattening pens <laughs> in Tenochtitlan, where prisoners were brought. I have a, a, a young woman with supernatural powers, a witch who's there as a pris prisoner. Mm -hmm. Tozi and Malinal is there as a prisoner, and they are fattened. They feed them special fattening food so that they'll be desirable to the god on the day they march them up the pyramid and cut their hearts out. Mm -hmm. You know, can you imagine being in a fattening pen for weeks and weeks and weeks and knowing that at the end of it you're going to be marched up a pyramid and somebody's going to cut your chest open with a black obsidian mm. knife and remove your heart? That's what we do to cows and pigs all the time, right? Yeah, mm. that's what we do to cows and pigs all the yeah, time. It's unbelievable. And we should consider our, our karma yeah. in all of these matters. It's something I think about a lot yeah. when I eat meat. But the problem is I know my body works better on meat and I don't have the money to go and get uh, venison that's been shot with a bow and arrow somewhere. You know what I mean? It's just like... Just do less. You know, how do you mean? Just do less meat. That's a start. You know, I think, I think I, 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 it's totally up to every individual what they do with meat and don't do with meat or fish or anything like that. I, I think this is it's totally a personal choice. I wouldn't wish to, to preach to anybody. But <laughs> perhaps we'd over-consume over it, you know. Perhaps, perhaps it's, it's possible to reduce its role in, mm. our, in our lives, and maybe that's, maybe that's a good thing. Certainly good for the planet. I mean, anybody who believes in global warming has got to know that, mm. that uh, the huge herds of cows and, and cattle that we, that we rear are, are actually, um, you know... Vast mm. producers of methane. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> so, so you know, we could just we could just be a bit more moderate mm -hmm. uh, in these in in, the, in these things. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I wouldn't wish to I wouldn't wish to preach. <laughs> I eat I eat shellfish myself. I eat, you don't uh, eat any any other meat. I don't. No, since 1986. I was a vegetarian, complete vegetarian, for a long time. But to be honest, I got bored. Okay. And uh, you know, probably, probably when 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 I get to the end of this life, I'll find that the one thing that you're really not allowed to eat is <laughs> shrimps and scallops. <laughs> They're the most highly evolved life. Form. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's crazy. Graham, I was curious, what, what drives you as a person, especially now? I mean, it was probably different than 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but. Hmm. What, yeah, what is, what is important to you? Well, uh, I w what, is, what is important to me is, is I've touched on it already. It's not to waste this blessing I've been given of, of, a, of a life, not to waste it vegetating and not thinking, and, and, but, but rather to, to challenge and explore and find out everything I can and hopefully, you know, to leave it a better person than I was when I came in mm. and, and hopefully to leave behind me good memories where, where people will say, he helped me, um, 
he, he was nice to be around, not he hurt me, he was awful to be around, you know. I'd like to, I'd like to leave that, that, that legacy behind, that, cool. that, that something, some, something positive, that people would think well of me when I'm, when I'm gone, and that they would think well of me because I did right. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm blessed with, uh, with, with, with six children. Um, wow. They're yeah, yeah. an incredibly important part of <coughs> my life. I'm blessed with a wonderful wife and partner in life, Santa, who I share every adventure with, from you know the diving to the Amazon jungle. Everything. She does your we, photography. Right? She does photography. all the photography, and we, we we share these adventures together. And 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 you know she's she's brought a a spirit of 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 intelligence and wisdom and 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 nurture and gifted that to our. To our, to, our, to our children because you know I've been married twice before and I have two children from each of my two previous marriages and Santa has two children from her previous marriage but Santa's managed to bring all these six kids together into a beautiful family of siblings who, who care for and support each other and have a great time together and have a great time with with us I feel good about that that's I feel I cool. feel there right there is a, is a is a legacy that's worthwhile and is that different from say the 22 year old Graham Hancock or the 32 year old yeah the 22 year old Graham Hancock had an awful lot to learn. Was he driven I, by ego too? I certain? would say I would say so, and I don't right. deny that I'm you know I'm driven by ego still. I, we can't you can't get rid of it. It's not it's not something you can just totally get rid of. I'm not Buddha, you know. Right. I'm not a bodhisattva. I'm I'm a human being like 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 everybody else. But I have, I think I have understood the perils of ego, and I try to and I try to deal with that consciously. Uh, as as best as I can. I don't always succeed by any means, but I do try to I do try to deal with it. I think a little bit of ego is healthy. I really do. Do you? I do. I think it, it makes you do your best. It makes you have pride in your work. I think it makes you you know get things done that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. As long as you can check that in some way, you have to check it in some yeah, you way. Could be yeah. right. Yeah. Or look at it you know from a different perspective. Mm. You know you you I, I was starting to read Supernatural, and you started off with. Um, uh, with talking about Iboga, it, I think which you took at your place in Bath, and yep. I just had to ask you about that. I was going to ask the same because thing because it's something that I I haven't done, and I don't necessarily plan on doing it. Yeah. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Yes, and why you um, did it. well, uh, so Iboga uh, is the root bark of a of a bush that grows in Central Africa, um, and it's called there the plant that enables men to see the dead. It's rather like uh, in a sense, ayahuasca, which is the vine of souls or the vine of the dead, rather similar function. Um, it's a very powerful uh, visionary agent. Um, it probably was, a, it's, its use was a probably originally developed by pygmy cultures in Central Africa and then picked up by neighboring people. So its use is quite widespread in Cameroon, in Gabon, for example. Uh, just as ayahuasca, uh, is part of daily life in the countries surrounding the Amazon basin. Because that's, by the way, one thing to make clear about ayahuasca, that ayahuasca may be shunned and demonized in the West and may be illegal in the West, but it is totally legal uh, throughout the countries surrounding the Amazon basin. And not only, not only legal, but its use is, is protected under laws of religious freedom. This is considered a fundamental religious right of the individual to, to work with ayahuasca should they, should they wish to do so. Same with Iboga in Central, in Central Africa. Um, I didn't go to Central Africa to take uh, Ibogaine, which is the active ingredient of Iboga, the extract, uh, in the way that I went to the Amazon to drink ayahuasca. Um, I took uh, Ibogaine here in England, and I, and I took the precaution because because Ibogaine it doesn't just ch challenge you psychologically, and it, ch it challenges you physically much more than ayahuasca does. Yeah. Uh, and it can actually kill you, um, especially, it can, it, especially if you have a compromised liver uh, in any way. Okay. Uh, so I worked with, um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a healer, a lady here, who um, gives Ibogaine to drug addicts. Um, that's her, that's her primary function. Ibogaine is, a, is, is astonishingly successful at getting people off addictions to hard drugs. More so than ayahuasca as far as a I would say right? more so than ayahuasca, okay. yeah. Although Apparently both. When, a, when a heroin addict is serious about quitting, they yeah. take Iboga. They take Iboga. Yeah. And, and Iboga will, will put you through the mill but help you through that process of, mm. of ending 
uh, an addiction to, to, to heroin. And it's thoroughly documented. I mean, there's a massive amount of examples of this. It does do that, and it does do so in the same way by confronting you with the truth about yourself. Um, so so she, gives, she helps drug addicts get off drug addiction by using Iboga. Um, and she works with a medical doctor. Uh, she will not do a session unless a medical doctor is also present. Um, and she agreed, uh, I, I was not addicted to heroin or, or cocaine, uh, but she agreed to give me Iboga uh, for consciousness exploration purposes. And so I had a session with uh, Ibogaine uh, in, my, in my home. Um, why did you do this? <laughs> well, it was again part of the research for Supernatural. Just as okay. for the same reason I went to the Amazon to drink ayahuasca, I felt it was important to, uh, to also take the plant that enables men to see the dead. And, and the fact that my own father had died very shortly before that, and that I felt I had unfinished business with him, that I was not at his bedside when he passed, something that, um, that uh, I, I, I feel... I feel very sad about to this day. Um, I should have been there, um, and I wasn't. Um, I'd been with him the week before. I'd been assured that he had many weeks left. And I went away to do some work, and while I was away, he died. And um, one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my life, it's a sacred duty to see those we love through the transition. And I should have been there, and I wasn't. Have you always felt that? No, I've come to understand this. I don't think I understood it properly then, which okay. was in 2003. Um, I, it's something I've come to understand. We need to be longer. there. We need to be, we need to be there okay. for, those, for those we love. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that. Before. Dude, every single day, uh, I mean, I, I guess this is probably a symptom of some sort of psychological low-level paranoia or something, but every day I try to prepare myself for the death of my parents. It's something yeah. that I'm terrified of. But I know we all have to face it if we're lucky enough to have parents that are around. Yeah, mm. yeah. You know? we, all, we all have to face it. And, and, and it's two things. It's a, it's, a, it's a sacred duty to see a loved one through the transition. Mm -hmm. And it's also a tremendous gift that that loved one gives to us. Mm. Um, is is the, the opportunity to learn from that, from that transition and, and to understand what it, what, mm -hmm. what it means. And... and um, I wasn't there for my dad. So um, the fact that, uh, that uh, Ibogaine is, Iboga is used in Central Africa quite specifically for that purpose, to contact okay. the spirits of the dead, uh, who it's recognized we often have unfinished business with, that has been abruptly terminated, mm -hmm. and that, that it, it offers the opportunity to contact them beyond the veil. Um, that uh, that was the other motive, really, for, for taking uh, Ibogaine. And in fact, I did have some sense of, it was very fleeting, and it was very tantalizing. I felt myself to be surrounded by a crowd of, I can only call them ghosts of figures, which were all around me. And right out on the edge of that circle, just walking by, limping by, was my father, and a sense of almost a connection. It, it was healing for me. It, I, I, I would have preferred it if it had been more intimate and there had been more, some kind of, some kind of exchange, some kind of parting of the, parting of the ways. The one thing I'm, I'm glad about is that in his last weeks, I did have the opportunity to tell him I loved him which was something I had never told him before. I never said that to my dad yeah. in all my years. But I, I, did, I did manage to say that. At least, at least I said that. Okay. So you had a bit of closure with the aboga ceremony? Or yes, it helped me. It did, it did help me. It did help me with closure, and it did, and it did help to penetrate the veil. But, uh, but I also came out of the session with a firm determination never to take a book again. <laughs> was it I was put through 48 hours of absolute physical hell. It really is 48 hours. Yeah, I was, it was devastating. Wow. Physically, physically devastating, way beyond anything that ayahuasca does. Right. does made tame. ayahuasca look tame. Yeah, afterwards. made ayahuasca look tame in terms of the, in terms of the physical physical effects. Um, it was it was really, I mean, massive. Uh, and I was, I mean, I thought I was dying. I was really, really ill. Um, but 
And would you out of it? Were you ultra ultra conscious and in the moment? Did you kind of know what was happening? No, there were there were times when I wasn't in the moment. There was times there was times when I drifted, drifted away. If I ever did contemplate working with Iboga again, which is most unlikely, I would go to Central Africa and take it there uh, in a shamanic uh, Mm -hmm. context and and uh, in the way that I've been to the Amazon to work with ayahuasca. You think that would make a different experience? I think it would, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Graham, if you're really a tough guy, you take ayahuasca and boga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll leave, that, I'll leave that for someone else to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Is, have you, do you think you've explored all of the, the substances for this point in your life? That, 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 that Those kind of... Um, I've done exhausting. some. I've done some work with you, you know the active ingredient of ayahuasca is DMT, yes. dimethyltryptamine. Um, I've I've done some work with pure DMT as well. Yeah. Um, which, uh, I've done eleven <coughs> ju- eleven journeys with with pure DMT. Okay. And this guy's a black belt in psychedelics. <laughs> huh? We're just like the uh, white belts, right? We we considered that before ayahuasca, but I think we we correctly waited and decided to go for the. the well, ceremony. here's the thing: with ayahuasca, there's some negotiation. Okay, you drink it; it takes about forty five minutes or an hour to onset. And it's very rare to completely lose contact with this realm. You kind of know who you are and where you are. It's true that with a very large dose of ayahuasca, you can actually lose connection to this world for a while. Mm-hmm. But, but usually, you have some control over the process. You kind of come in and out. And you kind you of come in and out. It comes in waves. Right. And that's why I say there's some negotiation with ayahuasca. It's in, in a way, although you have these harsh physical effects, it's kind of gentle and organic. With smoked DMT, there's no negotiation at all. DMT takes no hostages. I mean, you know, you are, you are going to inhale that smoke from the pipe and it is going to just leap into your brain within seconds. Uh, you are going to be on the f- business end of a rocket ship flying into a completely other reality. And... Uh, you are going to stay there until DMT lets you go, which fortunately is only about 12 minutes, okay. 12 or 15 minutes, as against several hours of the ayahuasca journey. You're in and out of a DMT journey in, in 12 or 15 minutes. Um, it is a massively powerful uh, psychedelic. And uh, again, the sense of contact with uh, intelligences, far more powerful than yourself, who are out there, usually invisible to us, is very strong with, with DMT. And, and you know, I would urge anybody who's interested in this to read The Spirit Molecule right. by Rick Strassman, because uh, he's um, a doctor at the University of New Mexico uh, who got federal approval to, give, to do a study with DMT and human volunteers. And he gave DMT over a period of four years to 50 or 60 volunteers. Mm-hmm. And they, their extraordinary experiences are documented uh, in Rick Strassman's uh, book, The Spirit Molecule. And uh, it's very instructive to, to, to read that and to realize that people who weren't comparing notes uh, were actually meeting and having communication with the same intelligent entities uh, in the DMT space. But something about the DMT space is much more mechanical. Um, it's much more constructed, even oddly technological, mm. uh, than the ayahuasca space. Is it introspective or not as much? Um, I, I wouldn't say that there's much real introspection going on. It's, it's really like you have just been plucked out of this world and dumped down in another one which is just utterly different from anything you've ever experienced before. Okay. And, 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 and it can be utterly terrifying. I've had gentle journeys with, with DMT where I felt that I was being healed, where entities were working with me and making me uh, healthier. Than, no. I, than I was before, but I've, I've also had terrifying journeys. What, well, uh, have been with, confronted by demons or...? Um, the, most, the most terrifying journey that I had with DMT was... Uh, there's a thing in ancient Egyptian mythology called the Hall of Mart, uh, or the Judgment Hall of Osiris, mm-hmm. which is a place of absolute clarity and truth, uh, where um, you are... Th- they symbolize it as the weighing of the heart. The heart is the soul, mm-hmm. is, is, the, is the symbol of the soul, and it's weighed in the scales against the feather of truth, the feather of cosmic harmony, the feather of mart. Um, and every action and every thought and every uh, instant of your life is accounted for there. 
in the Hall of Judgment. And okay. my most terrifying DMT journey was like being in the Judgment Hall of Osiris. Mm -hmm. um, and of having a sense that some cocoon body that surrounded my body was just being torn and ripped apart and that the real me was being exposed um, and scanned with absolute honesty and clarity mm. and the, the, a sort of dark shadowy room with strange kind of engines around the side and little beings running running around and uh, uh, something demonic about it actually okay. it was it was a, 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 like a journey to hell uh, in a way mm. um, but it was also something I needed at that time um, it's intense Brian but, but it was extreme it, it was extremely intense and I, I'm not I'm not sure if I'll smoke DMT ever again. Mm. I'm not sure. There's apparently um, a psychedelic or a hallucinogenic that um, is found on the back of a frog. It's called Quambo or something. Uh, well, there's there there's bufotenine. I mean, there is a there is a there is a there are psychedelic frogs. Yeah, psychedelic mm -hmm. toads, um, which uh, which is closely related to to DMT. Oh, I see. Five five meo DMT. Excuse me. I'm not an expert on this, but there are there are there is a secretion from a frog, which is which you can actually smoke. And which is which is um, extremely powerful and mm -hmm. and uh, molecularly related to DMT. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask if you'd tried that. No, I haven't. No, no I haven't. Um, it's, it's I, on I, the to-do list. My, right? my my my. Well, no. My I, I don't. You know, I don't feel one must endlessly explore these areas. I I feel that the that my teacher is ayahuasca, mm -hmm. and that I have a lot of lessons still to learn, and I'm going to go on working with. Okay with ayahuasca mm. um, and, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether I need or want to do uh, any more other substances. Fair enough. Um, and that's one of the things that I would also like to be understood in our society is that these decisions should not be devolved upon the state. These, these decisions are decisions that we should reach as responsible adults to decide what is right for us and what is not right for us, so long as we do not get in the face of others mm -hmm. and cause harm and damage to others. I think the, the term you used was psychic sovereignty, which I really liked. Psychic sovereignty. I feel, that, I feel that that's, you know, the fundamental abuse of human rights in our society, that our society is a society under the guise of all kind of propagandistic bullshit which is denying us the right to sovereignty over our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. And if we're not sovereign over our own consciousness, then actually we're not sovereign over anything. Mm -hmm. and, and all the so-called freedoms of our society are complete illusions when that society does not allow us to make fundamental decisions about what we wish to explore or not to explore mm -hmm. with our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what we are. We are consciousness. Mm -hmm. We are not these bodies. You know, we are not matter. Yeah. We are consciousness, pure consciousness manifested in physical form. Mm -hmm. And if we can't make decisions about that, then everything else is just a bad joke. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Wow, very. Do you think you'll be um, drinking ayahuasca in, for the rest of your life, annually? I'm not sure. I'll take that lesson from ayahuasca. Right, yeah, um, I, I know people who've worked with ayahuasca for many years, and ayahuasca has said to them, that was your last session. Yeah. That's okay. enough. Time you know, to stop. When you, when you asked him if, if he had you know, done enough or seen enough, I was just thinking that we probably never have. And I always think that I'll probably have to be reminded every year, potentially, mm -hmm. of the things that I'm not focused on. You know? yeah. yeah. And that's a good reminder to have. Yeah. It's a good yeah. reminder to have. Wow, you know we're uh, we're off on October second to to go visit Mr. Joe Rogan, oh, and uh, I know you you were there what a year ago or a year and a half. Yeah, ago? I was actually with Joe very shortly before I went down to Brazil and had my ayahuasca sessions. I was with Joe at the end of September or early October, and then I went down to Brazil and got kicked about for five oh, five okay. sessions. So and, that was the before, and and gave up uh, gave up cannabis. Did, um, did you get stoned with Joe? Because one of our fans <laughs> has asked us if we we're going to get high with him, and Brian doesn't want to, and I kind of want to, and we're. <laughs> Actually, to be completely honest, Joe and I did not get stoned together. No, okay. I, I'd, uh, I'd been at a, at a conference um, down in Irvine, and then I drove up to where Joe, Joe lives in, in part of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we sat down. I got there a bit late, and it was, it was late at night, and we, we sat down and, and did the podcast. And I, looking at the comments, because I, I, I have Joe kindly allowed me to ho host that podcast on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And lots of people think, you know, when Joe gets up that he's going off to, you know, <laughs> to take a puff on the bong or, or you know, that these guys <laughs> are totally <laughs> stoned. But actually, no, we weren't. We weren't stoned. We were, we were, we were completely straight dur okay. during that session. But Joe is just such a, 
a lovely, wonderful human mm -hmm. being with an incredibly open and inquiring mind mm -hmm. and just very, very gentle and very, very intelligent. That's cool. And I, I loved talking to him and I definitely got high on the conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're both so excited to meet him. It's great. You're yeah. going to have a, you're going to have a wonderful time. I'm he's sure a, he he's a great human being and That's you're really going to love it. It was the first time I'd ever heard about Graham and the first time I think I'd ever heard about ayahuasca was on that show. Right. So, right. and it was really, um, it was, a, it was a great show because you talked about your work and I think at the end you started talking about Yeah, ayahuasca, we got so. into these issues quite late in yeah. the, quite late in the and show. So it was really interesting because you, you make a lot of assumptions about Graham when you see him and he talks about his passion at work and then he just goes somewhere else and then <laughs> you're like but you know he's built up so much credibility with his knowledge that you're like okay I want to listen to this and that's Thank you. it's it's a good thing about you by spreading all these different messages I think Thank you. Because you appeal to a lot of people. Thank you. I know you're on a speaking tour soon, and I wanted to know how can people find out about that or we'll get in touch with you. Well, my website is uh, the first obvious, obvious portal, www.grahamhancock.com. Okay. And there's a, there's a tours, events, and lectures page on that website. And it happens that in um, October, November, and December, I am doing quite a bit of speaking. I've been off the radar for more than a year because I've been writing intensely, but having, having finished these two volumes of, of War God, I'm taking a bit of a break. I'm going to go and do some speaking. So I'm going to be uh, speaking in the US in early October, in Australia uh, through mid-October to about 23rd of October, um, and then back in the US again in December. And all the details of that are on my, uh, on my website. Okay. Uh, and I also have uh, a Facebook personal page and a Facebook author page, easy to find. Okay. Uh, the information is on is on there. Um, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, I try to to keep people in, informed. Yeah, your YouTube channel is very good. I mean, you have a lot of great videos there, and uh, yeah. this show is going to be on your uh, it's Graham, Thank Graham you. Hancock dot net, right? Uh, great, uh, well, it's dot Graham com. Hancock dot com. Dot D O T C O M. Yeah, yeah, yeah can find yeah, you yeah, easily. Yeah. And you're on Twitter at Graham double underscore. Hancock, uh, yeah, Graham underscore Hancock. I'm not sure if it's double underscore. Or not. I, I think it might be, but I'll, I'll check on that. Okay, and I'll, I'll post it on the okay. Fantastic. on the video. You know, I. <laughs> You know what I was going to say um, after the show, I might as well say it now, is that exceeded all my expectations and my expectations were really high. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I, I have to agree. I watched a, a, a large amount of your videos um, beforehand, just right. to kind of preparation. But um, yeah, you're, you're a very powerful man in person. Thank so, you. So. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, it was time, has, time has flown. <laughs> it reminded me of my discussion with Joe, actually. Nice, relaxing, <laughs> positive, enjoyable feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, That's because um, <laughs> Brian and I popped a couple of pills before. We <laughs> <laughs> relaxing with, with like-minded with like people. It's good. Um, it's good to talk about things. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great conversation people are really going to enjoy. So uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. I appreciate you making the trip. And my pleasure. To London and, my uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay, and uh, until then. It's about the journey. All right. It's about the journey. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. Welcome to London. Are you looking at me? <laughs> if you're in a public place, um, then you have every right to photograph and film as much as you like. And uh, you will get um, private security and police tell you you can't do this and you can't do that. And, but you need to do the rights. You need to... You know,